Hey everyone, we are in for a treat as we have the legend, the best-selling author of numerous books, the founder of Primal Kitchen, one of our favorite brands here at Mind Buddy Green, Mark Sisson, back on the show. Mark, welcome. Thanks. Great to be back, Jason. It's been a long time. It's 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 been a long time. And so the, the latest book, Two Meals a Day, Cookbooks, the follow-up to the previous book. Um you know, you, you, dive, you dive into fasting again, you have amazing delectable recipes. And so, look, I think so many people are aware of what intermittent fasting is or intermittent eating or circadian fasting or time restricted eating, whatever, whatever you choose. There's no wrong answer here. No wrong answer <laughs> here. But, but I'm curious, you're, you, you're a guy known for always being on top of the science. What do we know about the benefits right now in terms of choose your flavor of, of how you define what it is what, what are the benefits and are they different across uh different across uh the time spent fasting no it's a great question um what are the benefits the benefits uh, sometimes you have to put this in context what are you looking to benefit by and from uh so one of the benefits is um, the creation of what we call metabolic flexibility. So you become very good at burning fat in addition to what we're all good at, which is burning sugar. Uh, so one of the benefits is the ability to burn off your stored body fat during all those times that you're not actually eating food. And uh, that is a, is a huge benefit for a lot of people. Um, along with that benefit comes of necessity the ability to extract energy, to be energetic, to to not have to feel uh, low blood sugar and mood swings and hangriness over the course of a day just because you elected not to eat a meal or two or three in a row. Your body becomes so metabolically efficient that you extract this energy from your stored body fat, from ketones, from a number of other substrate possibilities. So there's a there's an efficiency that comes with that that begets an added uh, sense of energy. Uh, and with that, obviously, the empowerment uh, that that energy brings. Um, now, we could go into, you know, the longevity, the purported longevity benefits of fasting. And I say purported because, uh, you know, we talk about autophagy, the fact that uh, when you don't eat um, for an extended period of time, your body goes into a, a house cleaning mode and it starts to take care of um, some of the damaged tissues uh, there's a survival mechanism at work there that uh, we can only postulate from an evolutionary basis. Uh, but you know, when a when a cell is faced with not a lot of nutrition surrounding it, i.e., when you're not when you're not eating and you're not causing this cascade of of new glucose coming in, new carbohydrate, new um, uh, you know amino acids and fats, the cell basically thinks to itself, if cells could think. Um, normally I would divide and uh, I would, with, with all of this wonderful nutrition around, with all this excess uh, glucose and carbohydrate and, and, and fat and protein, I'll just divide. That's my job to pass the genetic material along to the next generation. But the cell would think to itself, no, nah, it's, it's not enough for me, let alone for two of me. So I will go inward and I will look at ways in which I can maybe consume, combust some of the damaged proteins within the cytoplasm. Maybe I'll consume or combust some of the damaged uh, fats. Uh, maybe I will take this opportunity to repair DNA. So the thought process, uh, which was initially, you know, proposed uh, by my friend and mentor, Art Devaney, all the good things happen to the body when you're not eating, right? So all of the repair and all of the, 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 um, the, the <clears throat> ability of the body to achieve um, homeostasis and to come back into um, an ideal body composition. All these things happen when you're not eating. Now, you have to eat once in a while, clearly, but all the good stuff happens when you're not eating. So, so, so the issue becomes one of um, what's an appropriate amount of time to not eat. Uh, and as I thought through this uh, equation in the past uh, few decades, I did come to the realization that pretty much all of us eat too much food. <laughs> um, this is a, it's a universal problem in the United States. Um, you know, we have access to inordinate amounts of, of food, some of it good, most of it crappy. 
Um, it's everywhere. It's you know uh, in restaurants, in, in your pantry, in your cupboard, in your in your refrigerator, probably in the glove compartment of your car. Um, you know, at every street corner, there's always food around. So we tend to eat too much food, and many of us do so from a perspective of, well, I can get away with it. I mean, I can eat this food, and I haven't gotten huge. So a lot of people go through life thinking, what's the most amount of food I can eat? at this meal and not feel like a slob or a glutton? What's the most amount of this dessert that I can have and not be uncomfortable later on? Um, you know, what's what's the most amount of this that I can actually get away with because I'm wired to overeat? And with that tendency that we all have, uh, many of us gain weight. It's one or two pounds a year, two or three pounds a year, but that adds up to 40, 50, 60 pounds over a few decades. So. The thought experiment I did a long time ago was, all right, wait a minute, what's, maybe that we're asking ourselves the wrong question, not what's the most that I can get away with, what's the least amount of food I can eat, uh, maintain muscle mass or even build muscle mass in the process, have all the energy I need, um, uh, not get sick, and most importantly, not be hungry. See, hunger is the thing that derails this all. But if you can if you can do an experiment where you say, what's the least amount of food I can eat, maintain muscle mass, have all the energy I want, not get sick, and not be hungry, then you find that it's not a lot of food. And in many cases, people who, who go on my programs started out as the keto reset diet and became, you know, two meals a day. Um, and the two meals a day, by by the way, is is two of the what you what you used to call ordinary meals you just skipped one ordinary meal so now you're eating a third fewer calories than you were the, before you started this program and you realize that's that's really all you need to get to to again to have the energy to be lean and to find the mm -hmm. ideal body composition to be strong to be fit and most importantly to not be hungry and so what has worked for you is it, is it 13 hours, 16, 18, a blend of all of the above? What have you found personally? So, so what I found, um, not just personally, but a lot of my uh, readers, adherents, uh, have found that you wake up in the morning and if you are metabolically flexible, if you've built this metabolic flexibility, if you've built this ability, this metabolic machinery to extract energy from your stored body fat, then it's a seamless transition. The body doesn't know or care whether the 500 calories that you get over the next 12 hours come from a plate of food or your thighs or your butt or your belly. It just doesn't, it's a seamless sort of transition. Uh, so most people find that when they wake up in the morning, they're, they're not that hungry. They're, they don't feel a compelling need to go eat breakfast, which, you know, we used to call the most important meal of the day. And it's not. Uh, so for me, um, you know, I'm going to have my first meal today, probably around two o'clock. Um, you know, it's noon while we're recording this. I've just come off of a bunch of meetings this morning and, um, and I'll take a little break after this and probably go get something to eat, which I will call lunch. But that's a typical day for me is a, is a one, you know, one or 1 PM, 2 PM start window for eating and then, um, dinner at seven or seven thirty two meals a day and no need to snack in between, no compelling urges to, to nosh on, you know, candy or donuts or, or any of that stuff. It's this having arrived at this metabolic efficiency and metabolic flexibility. That is my, my wish for everyone, uh, because it is, it is probably the most empowering, uh, personal, um, uh, you know, uh, skill that you could develop over a lifetime. And so what are some of the pitfalls people encounter when they decide they, they want to begin an intermittent fasting lifestyle? Well, I think a lot of people um, assume that they can't make it through a meal without eating something. And so people maybe surround themselves with, with snacks. Um, they, you know, they, they might not give it enough time and might give up after a week or two. It takes about three weeks. Of a real dedicated um, um, discipline, not work, uh, to 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 sort of get to that point where all of a sudden you realize, wow, it's like ten thirty in the morning, and I'm not hungry, and I wasn't hungry, and I have some energy, and I feel like going for a walk, and I'm okay with it. So I think a lot of people give up 
too soon. A lot of people, um, you know, my my basic strategy, and I think the, the shortcut, if you will, to this is to cut out uh, all the carbs and cut out the sh- you know sh- sugars and sweets and and sweetened beverages, and um, uh, you know, and, and just come down to a list of real whole foods. Um, so protein probably leads the way for most people who are engaging in this in this transaction. Protein and healthy fat, um, and you can with, with that you can have all of the vegetables you want. You can have salads and you know steamed broccoli and Brussels sprouts and whatever else you want. They're almost like a free a free source of of carbohydrates because they're locked in this fibrous matrix. Uh, so that you know I could the the book two meals a day. Basically, it's all there in the title. Two meals a day. Okay, we're done. We can you go home now. <laughs> but the book, the book basically gives you know strategies on how to how to get to the point where two meals a day is not just comfortable; it's desirable. I mean, I would say again, a, a lot of people who get to the point of two meals a day then graduate to one meal a day, and it's not like they're giving anything up. It's not like you're sacrificing. These are people who went, who, who basically go, um, well, like, I, I can't believe it. I have all this energy. I have, you know, my, my liver's creating ketones, not massive amounts of ketones, just enough to keep my brain very happy all day long. So I'm not hungry. I'm not hangry. Um, you know, I'm in the gym, I'm lifting weights. Um, I have all the energy I need. And, and all of a sudden I'm not even hungry for the lunch that was supposed to be my first meal. Uh, so a lot of people go to, to basically one meal a day, uh, and, and I have, you know, clients and friends who, you know, may, maybe still have 10 or 20 pounds to lose and they're starting to get to this mark. Like, like, when does it, <laughs> like, okay. when, when do I feel hungry again? Cause I'm not hungry. And I'm like, you know, congratulations. You, you've succeeded at turning your body into a metabolically efficient, metabolically flexible machine. And, and one day you'll get hungry. And you'll, and that'll be the signal to, you know, to start upping your, your intake. But for right now, don't question it. You know, if you're, again, if you're, if you have the energy, if you're not cold, if you're not, you know, suffering any sort of other symptoms, this is great. This is you being a perfect human surviving in, in, you know, in in an environment where everyone else is kind of falling apart from an excess of food. And here you are thriving on what we would might call the minimum effective dose of food. So you mentioned falling apart and I asked about pitfalls and, you know, to me, a pitfall, let's say you make it through and you're doing the the two meals a day or one meal a day. Pitfall is eating out, going to a restaurant. I like eating out. I like going to restaurants. I like having a good time and and eating outside when it's, when it's nice out. Any tips for, for people when they're, when they're dining out in a restaurant? What's the issue? What, what, what what would make that? Um, have you called well, it a pitfall or fall off a wagon? Well, I think so. Like it's it's no secret you are not a fan of seed oils, and we're going to talk about that. So, in terms of if I want to sit down, it, it's not a pitfall in terms of fasting. It's a pitfall in terms of quality of food, making sure I'm getting the right mix of of, of protein and vegetables, and just like what are you know, and eating out happens, and and seed oils happen or or not. Anything no, you're, that's a good point. Seed oils happen more often than not in most restaurants, and and it's kind of criminal the way you'll go to a great restaurant in, in Manhattan or in Miami beach. And you'll have this, um, buyer back in the kitchen. Who's buying the best cuts of beef, the best quality fish, the produce, um, you know, un, unparalleled anywhere else. And then they screw it all up by making dressings with soybean oil or by frying it or cooking it in some, you know, um, not just industrial seed oil, but, but probably old rancidified industrial seed oil. Um, so, you know, have a conversation with the waiter, ask for the chef to come out. Just say, look, um, I'm, I'm here, I'm uh, on a keto diet. I have a, a you know, I have an aversion to, to soybean, canola and corn oil. What can you make in extra virgin olive oil? Uh, what can you, what can you bake for me? What can you, uh, you know, make a steak in butter if you can. I mean, there, there's so many workarounds when you dine out. Now we're not talking about, uh, you know, going to a fast food chain and asking for some allowances there. But if, if it's any sort of fine dining, uh, you can absolutely work within the, within the context of this program. 
and have all of your needs met and, and have an, an enjoyable, wonderful evening out. And, uh, you know, and, and, and don't eat all the steak, you know, cut it, cut it in half and take some home or whatever. It's, it's, I am, I'm a little bit amused by people who find dining out so daunting. Um, you know, when I wrote the original, um, primal blueprint way back in 2008 and nine, I was giving, uh, giving talks and on the road. And one night I was at, uh, I had a, to give a talk in Sacramento and I wasn't yet on my one meal a day kick, I was, I needed to eat, you know, a couple of times during the day and I hadn't eaten all day. I'd traveled all day and I get about an hour before I'm supposed to go on stage. And I asked this, uh, my host, you know, where can we eat? Well, there was only like a Chipotle down the road. I'm like, great. And so we went and got a double order of guacamole and a double order of carne asada. And I had one of the best meals I ever ate. And it was totally keto and totally fine. And, and I was energized and, you know, it took the edge off. It's it's always uh, doable, and it really I I, I would suggest that it's a, a matter of communication with the kitchen staff. I love Chipotle, and and this this is specifically for me and and our Miami listeners because you live in Miami and moving to Miami. What, what restaurants in Miami do you have this conversation? Please tell me so I can show up and say no. I want to talk to chef. My friend Mark Sisson says you're you're okay to do this. Where, where do you go? So a lot Miami? of times um, I'll go to a restaurant if I know that they they have some of the greatest tasting salad dressings in the world that that will just conf- you know they'll they'll, they'll put another. 900 calories of crappy seed oils on whatever s- salad is, it is I'm getting. I'll just say oil and vinegar. Just bring me, you know, extra virgin olive oil and vinegar. I'll be happy as can be. Um, you know, uh, make it up by putting more colorful vegetables in the, you know, in the salad. Or I'll ask for um, uh, things to be grilled in butter. I'll pay extra for it. I don't care. Um, you know, I, in fact, I'm a seafood lover and I go to, uh, prime Italian and uh, Prime 112 are very close to me. And um, and I just, uh, if I have uh, the crab cocktail or the shrimp cocktail or lobster, I just bring me melted butter, pay extra for it. I don't, I don't, I, I'm sure you have great sauces, but I actually prefer the melted butter. And I, and I would consider that an ideal meal as a boy from Maine, as a, as a lobster, a guy from a lobster fishing village in Maine. That's my ideal meal. I mean, there are lots of, again, there are a lot of restaurants that I eat at um, in Miami. And I, I, I mean, I give you, a, I don't sound like an advertisement for it, but I eat at Santorini, I eat at Red, I eat at Prime, I eat at, um, you know, uh, I, there's a couple of sushi restaurants near us. Um, it's all good. Well, I'll have to get you the, the list after the show. I, you mentioned Prime. Prime Fish has an amazing wild salmon. Yeah. You mentioned metabolic flexibility a couple of times. Can you spend a moment just talking about how important it is humans are wired to extract energy from all sorts of substrates we are wired given the right circumstances to extract energy from uh the carbohydrate that we consume the glucose in the bloodstream the the uh, glycogen in your muscles or your liver uh the fat on your plate of food or the fat stored on your body uh the ketones made by your liver in the absence of carbohydrate we have all of these wonderful energy substrates that we're that we are wired to be able to access given the right circumstances. The problem is most of us throughout our lives have such access to a carbohydrate rich, carbohydrate based, sugar based diet that we get into this uh, mode from an early age, right? Like as soon as our parents start giving us uh, cereal and bread and rice and crackers and all the stuff that they do because they love us so much, uh, we develop this this dependency uh, on carbohydrates. And with that dependency, uh, the more carbohydrates you eat, the carbohydrates basically have an effect on the body. They turn into glucose within a matter of minutes, in most cases, um, in the bloodstream. And that causes the pancreas to secrete insulin. Insulin is a a storage hormone. Insulin seeks to get rid of the glucose in the bloodstream and put it into the muscle cells, put it into the fat cells, put amino acids into the muscle cells, put fat into the fat cells. Insulin is Sort of a master hormone that controls access to the cell, the inside of the cell, and and as we um, develop this this um, dependency on sugar and carbohydrates over our lives, uh, we 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 the excess always gets put into the cells, and much of it gets put into the fat cells. Um, but because the the insulin has this effect of taking the glucose out of the bloodstream and 
lowering the, the glucose. If we haven't developed the, aber- the ability to, to burn fat effectively, the brain goes, oh my God, there's no more glucose. We have to eat again. And so, the, the, so you're co- compelled to have another carbohydrate-based meal. So that becomes a uh, breakfast of you know, pancakes or toast or, or waffles or oatmeal or whatever. Then it becomes like the bagel at 1030 at the office for a snack in the morning, uh, mid morning. And then it becomes uh, a sandwich for lunch or pasta for lunch or something with a burger with, with chips, another snack in the afternoon, and then um, mashed potatoes or French fries at dinner. And you become this, this carbohydrate dependent organism uh, that never learns how to store or how, no, shouldn't never learns how to access the stored fat. So as, as we get now, one of the, one of the ironies, the great ironies is that if you eat car, a lot of carbohydrate and your insulin raises high insulin levels cause, uh, fat to remain in the fat cells because the body goes, well, high insulin means there must be a lot of sugar. If there's a lot of sugar, we don't need to waste our precious stored energy in the form of fat. Let's not waste that. Let's not take fat out of storage. Let's keep burning the carbs and burning the... So most people go through their lives very uh, inefficient at, at accessing their stored body fat, burning it for fuel. Um, they don't have the metabolic machinery to understand, uh, to take ketones and send it to the, to the brain for... The brain hasn't become used to burning ketones. Uh, so, so metabolic flexibility is this skill, I would say, a life skill, where you teach the body, you build the metabolic machinery to, to burn stored body fat, you build the metabolic machinery to use the ketones that your liver makes, uh, for the, mostly for the brain, uh, and you offset the need to eat every two or three hours. And as we sort of opened the discussion, you can go long periods of time, very comfortably, very high energy, without needing to eat, without feeling cravings or hunger or any of this stuff. So when you mentioned cravings, you, you know, we're talking about fasting, we're mentioning about, we're mentioning burning fat. You know, if you take it up a level, you think about stressors, hormetic stressors. How do you think about all the stressors available to us? You know, whether it's fasting, whether it's uh, cold plunge, you know, whether it's high intensity interval training, how do you think about stressors in terms of which provide the best ROI? Well, probably the fasting provides the best ROI, but um, again, we, we always have to look at these in context. And I've been thinking a lot about hormetic stressors recently. So the thing about um, stressors, uh, you know, they're, they're, they have different impacts at different times. So if you haven't worked out for a couple of days and you go do a cold plunge, that's a great horm- hormetic stressor. And if you, depending on how much time you spend in the water, um, it can be very beneficial, but if you spend too much time in the water, it can be counterproductive. Um, I had the experience myself a few weeks ago. I, I went to Saint, uh, I went to Necker Island. Oh, wow. Hanging out with Richard Branson. So the day, two days before I left, I did a hard bike ride on the sand in, the, in Miami Beach. And we have these fat bikes. And it's, so I took a friend out. We did an hour and a half. And I just, I, I, I wore him down. I wore him into the ground and he was uh, thrilled and pissed at the same time. And it was, it was a bit much uh, for both of us. The next day, I went for an hour and 20-minute uh, paddle in the heat uh, on Miami Bay, two hard days in a row. The third day, we fly to Necker, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to take the day off. Well, my friend says, no, this is your first uh, kiteboarding lesson. So uh, that after, we, we land at 2 o'clock, 3.30, I'm out on the beach with a kiteboard. Uh, you know, learning kiting. Well, apparently the first lesson of kiting is, is what they call body dragging. I don't know if you, if you know anything about kiting, but you basically are submerged in the water and, and the kite is dragging you through the water. You're, you're you know, steering the kite and you learn how to steer the kite this way. So I'm in the water for an hour and a half. Now, it's not cold water, but I didn't have a wetsuit on. I'm up to my neck for an hour and a half. And um, it was it was as... You know, maybe it was the water was 75, let's say. But an hour and a half in 75 degree water is that you know you get you get hypothermia. So I had two hard stress days in a row. Then I had the effect of doing a 10 or a 15 minute cold plunge at you know 38 degrees, three days in a row. 
that was not the kind of hormetic stressor that was going to benefit me. The next day, I could barely get out of bed. So I, I didn't get sick, but I was drag ass for the next two days because I'd overdone it, right? So when we look at these different stressors, we have to look at the context. So a high-intensity workout. If you look at a high-intensity workout, that's an amazing hormetic stress that your body is going to respond positively to, provided the day before you didn't do anything hard, and the day after you don't do anything hard. But if you do three high-intensity workouts in a row in three days, you will pay the price. It becomes too much. The body has, you know, it's like the, the, the old Nietzschean, you know, if it don't kill me, it makes me stronger. Um, you can come close to killing yourself doing some of these you know, high intensity, uh, stressful events. Uh, now, with regard to fasting, fasting, if you've trained for it, and if you are, um, if you've built the metabolic flexibility, that's not really a hormetic stressor. Quite often, people talk about the stress of fasting um, in the context of, of back to a, a high carb based diet. If you're a carbohydrate eating uh, animal, what we used to call a sugar burner back in the day, and you decide to fast because you read about it and you thought it was going to be a good idea, you decide to fast for 36 hours or 48 hours, your body's going to go crazy. Because if you haven't built the metabolic machinery to burn fat, to access ketones for the brain, then your brain is going, oh my God, where's my glucose? And it starts to create stress hormones, cortisol from the adrenals. The cortisol then goes looking for building blocks to make more glucose for the brain. And those building blocks come from muscle. So cortisol will literally cannibalize your muscle tissue in pursuit of three amino acids that it can convert to glucose to keep your brain happy. That's the type of hormetic stressor uh, that, that uh, fasting can be for some people who haven't worked their way into it. So context is, is very important in all of this. Yeah, and I, I worry, you know, you mentioned cold plunge, and I think it, it, it's really exciting. There's a lot of new science there. A, a lot of people are preaching the benefits of, of, of cold, cold plunging, cold water therapy. But to your point, just don't hop in, hop in you know, <laughs> Ant Antarctic temperature. Like No, but people do. They, like I, I tell people about, um, people ask me, I have a cold plunge at, at our apartment. Uh, we have a, I'm in a condo and there's a spa at the bottom and we have an amazing facility. We have a cold plunge, we have a jacuzzi, we have a steam room, we have a, a sauna. And so I do some fire and ice, we call it, uh, there. And people want to hear about it. And the next thing you know, people are like, how much time you spend in the, in the cold plunge? I'm like, well, um, I did uh, four and a half minutes yesterday. And then a week later they go, I did seven. You know, <laughs> I'm like, okay, all right. Uh, and, and, you know, what did that get you? You're still fat. Um, but, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's so we tend, we tend, especially with cold plunge and, and cold hormesis, we tend to, um, get caught up in the, you know, in the game of it, in the, um, in the, ch in the challenge, in the personal, in the headspace and not in, in looking to optimize the benefits. Right. So I, I see this happen a lot. It used to happen to me all the time with, with training. I would train. My running career ended uh, in 1980 when I was training for the Olympic trials uh, for the 1980 uh, Olympics. And uh, I did uh, five consecutive 20-mile runs in five days. And each day, I felt better. And each day, I ran faster until the last day, the wheels literally fell off. And it was the end of my running career. So we get, we get caught up in this. Wow in this uh you know mind mind game of more is better uh when in fact with cold hormesis with cold with cold plunging maybe more is not only not better maybe more is is significantly worse hey i'm always a fan of if if less is more i'm all for it mark i'm gonna come over when, when i move and I, i'm gonna say hey mark you did four and a half minutes i did 30 seconds <laughs> <laughs> do not compete i'm not going to get in the game competing with mark sisson god so you know you mentioned training for the olympics and and, and again I, I love you've been in the space for so long you have tremendous perspective and wisdom and you know, look wellness is a journey i found personally my wellness routine has evolved tremendously 
you know, in my 20s, coming off from playing basketball in college, I was in the weight room all the time. I was partying hard and, you know, the, the treadmill and whatever. I don't even know if it worked, but I did it. Um, in my 30s, yoga was transformative for me, saved me for back surgery. And now, you know, at age 47, I, I pivoted again, you know, strength training, but, you know, short, we're talking 20 minutes, a couple times a week, yoga, 10 minutes, a couple times a week, always walking, you know, taking the stairs. If, the, if, if I'm up for it and there's 10 flights, I'm doing it. Um, I'm curious, what's changed for you by the decade and how you've evolved your well-being practice? My, my um, early years as a runner were fully dedicated to uh, performance, maximizing my performance, uh, seeing how fast I could run a marathon or how, how quickly I could run a marathon. Um, when I got injured, as I just described in 1980, I pivoted to a triathlon uh, only because I could not envision a life where I wasn't beating myself up every day uh, training. So while I couldn't run 120 miles a week anymore, I could still run 40 miles a week and I could do so off off the bike where I was you know, maybe uh, riding 200 to 20 a week. So, and then I, I, I taught myself how to swim, big mistake, but is what it is. <laughs> so I did, I did my first triathlon ever was Ironman Hawaii. Uh, it was the first triathlon I ever did. Um, and I finished the next year, I went back and finished fourth. So I, I figured I had, you know, I, I had a, um, a career there and I was kind of tired of all of that struggling and suffering, managing discomfort my whole life as, as opposed to having fun. So I, I, I think it is literally the heart of the, an Iron Man. Like when I think of a world of pain, one of our best friends is an Iron Man champion, her and her husband, Hillary Biscay and Mike Twelfth. I'm like, this no, is a world all you of do pain. Look, <laughs> as as a marathoner, which I was uh, throughout the '70s, and then as a triathlete, your entire life it's never fun. It's never fun. It's all about managing discomfort. And the irony here is, um, on any given day, there's. 20 people at the starting line who are equally as gifted as you are, equally as trained as you are, probably want it equally as much as you want it that day. And that day comes down to who is willing to cause themselves such discomfort and drag everyone else down with them that they emerge through attrition, they emerge as the winner of the race. How fun does that sound, Jason? I mean, so, so to your point, over the decades, I, I, I wound up coaching professional triathletes. I wasn't competing anymore, but I, I still was jonesing on the on the energy expenditure. So in, even into my late 30s, I was I was an endurance athlete. I set the world record for the mile climb on the Versa Climber when I was 39. Uh, I don't know if you know the Versa Climber, that that climbing climbing thing in the gym. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I just you know then yeah. I said uh, you know what I'm I'm kind of over this and I started lifting weights uh, in my 40s and 50s. Um, I stopped running. Like when I say I stopped running, I stopped running entirely. I haven't run a mile in 25 years. Um, I started playing games. I started playing uh, ultimate frisbee. So I'm sprinting. I'm, I'm doing a lot of actual running, but I'm not, you know, putting on the shoes to go out and run a mile or 10 miles or whatever. Um, so I lift weights now. Um, I ride this fat bike on the beach. I do stand up paddling. I play ultimate frisbee. Um, and so I have a what I would consider the perfect blend of strength and cardio for someone who's going to be 69 next month uh to keep me um lean and fit and and um and and entertained enough without really managing pain so i said the other day i took this this friend out and we grounded out for an hour and a half on the fat bikes it was you know it was we were managing discomfort but i love the heat um it's miami beach so the the view is always great uh, and, uh, you know, we, we had a, we had a good time and it was two of us together. So we had a, we enjoyed that, but I don't, I, I can only do that maybe twice a week. Any more than that, I'm like, I'm not interested because it, again, we get back into that, into that pain cave, which I wanted to avoid for, for the rest of my life. And so what about nutrition philosophy? Has that evolved over the years? Oh, for sure. Um, I, I think, um, I've become more, um, I've, I've given myself more leeway. So, you know, it started, well, early on, it was all about carbs, right? When I was a marathoner and we didn't know about um, ketogenesis, we didn't know about how efficient ketones were at keeping the brain going in the absence of carbs. So as a, uh, 
And as a follower of Dr. Timothy Noakes, who was the godfather of carbohydrate metabolism in the 70s and 80s and 90s, everybody read The Lore of Running, L-O-R-E, The Lore of Running, and, uh, and, and figured out how to basically carbo load every single day. And again, as a runner, as an endurance athlete, why do you carbo load every day? Because you're going to go out and do it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And as, as you probably know from your, from your running days, it's a vicious cycle. And, you know, it's, I guess it has merits in sort of developing uh, an, an ability to withstand pain or whatever. But, and that probably served me well in, um, uh, in both uh, business uh, and my marriage. Um, but it, but it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to get, um, to get to that point where you enjoy every single workout. So, but you had to do it. You had to eat. You had, so it was 600 to 1,000 grams of carbs every single day. Well, when I stopped uh, training that hard, I knew immediately that I didn't need that to, to do the carb thing. So I switched over. I started in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, I started to know a lot about healthy fats. So I started to incorporate healthy fats into my diet. I got rid of the sugar. My, my half gallon of ice cream per day habit for 10 years, um, I let that go. Uh, and I started shifting over to uh, you know, what we would call the primal blueprint. I started researching this diet, which became the primal blueprint, which is basically an ancestral diet based on meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, a little bit of fruits and starchy tubers and things like that. Um, but we avoided legumes. Uh, we avoided, um, you know, for a while we avoided alcohol. And over the years, I brought a little bit, I like wines. So I brought some alcohol back in. I started saying, well, if legumes aren't that uh, problematic for you personally, experiment with that, bring those back in. So it became more of a diet of inclusion of the things that were still normal, natural, um, you know, again, grains and not grains, but legumes and things like that. Um, and, and kind of tailored to, to um, what can you get away with? What can you eat that you want to eat, that you enjoy eating, that you don't want to just by virtue of some dogmatic eating strategy, kick them out of your diet for the rest of your life, which a lot of people do, by the way. So I tried to I tried to be as inclusive after a while of some of these foods uh, as I could. Now, still doesn't include seed oils, still doesn't include, you know, sugar and, and stuff like that. But a lot of the the fringe, um, the fringe things over the years, um, you know, got got brought back in. Interestingly, for example, um, you know, I'm, I'm basically a carnivore now, and uh, reading Paul Saladino and uh, and Sean Baker, who are both friends of mine. Uh, Saladino would say, vegetables, stay away from them. But fruit, it's fine. Um, you know, fruit <laughs> wants to be eaten. Fruit is sweet for a reason. Uh, in Evolutionarily, we are, we are programmed to eat fruit. Uh, fruit wants to be eaten so we can disperse the seeds through our, uh, uh, through our feces into, you know, across the, across the wilderness. Um, vegetables don't want to be eaten, which is why they're bitter and, and have to be processed in most cases. Um, either through cooking or, or grinding or whatever to, to be. So it's an interesting concept. So at, based on that, I'm cutting out a lot of vegetables. I no longer eat a big ass salad every day. You know, I just, I, I'm uh, mostly focusing on protein and, and healthy fats. Interesting. I can't, for me personally, if I start to eat way too much meat and cut out vegetables, my lab work starts to go in the wrong direction. Um, but again, every, everyone's in, in unique. Yeah, but it's a, it's a good example of like what do you call wrong direction? So like some of the cardiovascular markers, uh, you know, ApoB, LPA. You know. Yeah, those. Yeah, so okay. it's like, uh, so I, I still eat meat. I just don't eat that much. But when I do, it's going to be amazing. I don't. I don't put it this way. I don't. I don't eat crappy meat. If I'm going to have meat. It's going to be. It's going to be really, really good. No reason to eat crappy meat. By the way, you know, good meat tastes good. Crappy meat doesn't taste that good in the first Agreed. place. So. So well, it, yeah. On that note, you know, it sounds like you've become a little more lenient. You know, if, I'll give an example. So I, I have like a sometimes list and a, a never list. So like sometimes like I'll do if, if there's amazing French fries, I'm going to get the French fries, even though I'm, you know, 99 percent sure they're, you know, fried in canola oil. But, you know, amazing French fries, get a glass of wine or a margarita, like I'm going for it. But I'll never have like a Coca Cola or but like you know I'll never have a real like soft drink. Ever. So like, do you have like a a never list for like uh, is it is it soda or is it? 
Yeah, probably is soda. I mean, I, not that I was ever really into it, but but I think uh, Coca Cola is is you know probably the single worst, uh, not food because it's not a food substance. You know, you can put it in your body, uh, bar none. Uh, so you know, I'm I'm uh, I don't know what else. I mean, I I I used to love ice cream. I still like it, but I'm like it's two two bites in or three bites in. I'm like, yeah, I got it. I got I got the sense of it. I don't need to finish the whole thing. That's that's one of the skills that I've developed over the years, and I I would wish upon anybody who who reads my work is to develop this intuitive sense of like when enough is enough. And sometimes, you know, with a great a great cheesecake, you get served this giant slice, which they say is a serving. So if it's one serving, I can that means I can eat the whole thing, right? And it's just one serving. Well, not really, but I mean, if you have you know that first bite that you have is probably a ten out of ten. That's amazing. The second bite, almost as good. By the time you get to the fourth or fifth bite, you're like, all right, I got a sense of what this is going to be like. It's pretty damn good. But at what point am I having a contest with myself to see what I can get away with, right? And so developing that intuitive ability to push it away and go, that was spectacular, and that's all I needed. That's that's the essence of life. You know, we it, it's I think what drives the, the problem most people have in this country isn't um, – addiction people talk about a food addiction or a sugar addiction um it's um it's it's unfettered access coupled with with um a lack of impulse control well building off of that i'll stay on ice, ice cream we had uh mark schatzker on the show a while ago and we talked about ice cream specifically and i thought this was fascinating so he talked about halo top and so you know halo top low cap people love it but because it doesn't have the full fat protein sugar profile you're actually you you're not full like you have to you end up eating the whole thing you are better off eating the real full on full fat ice cream you won't eat as much your brain sends a signal like all right I'm starting to get full versus the manufactured crap if you will doesn't get that signal you eat a lot more and so if you're gonna have whatever you're having get the full-on real thing the full fat the full experience the 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 whole end no for sure whether it's ice cream or whether it's kobe kobe beef you know or wagyu for the steak <laughs> get the full fat and, and so on that note you mentioned the fringe i'm curious is there anything that's trending now you know it's like wellness has come so far it's so exciting but there, there's a lot of stuff out there which eh, you know not so sure about i'm curious something specifically come to mind for you that that's maybe trending which you don't think has staying power or that you think science will eventually prove is you know bs well i mean i'm i'm on record as being sort of the anti-quantified self so i think wearables are uh for the most part a joke and i think that um in many cases uh no data is much better than bad data right. and i'm seeing a lot of bad data <laughs> on some of these things so um, you know, there's some, there's some wearables that are really good. I, I actually have one that I wear, um, the frontier frontier X heart rate monitor, which gives me an EKG readout. So just a short story. I did so much endurance training over 35 years that I fucked my heart up. So I have, um, you know, I have issues with uh, left ventricle, uh, scarring and things like that. I'm the guy who, you know, I, I, I went a hundred percent max heart rate four days a week for 30 years you know imagine if you went to the gym and lifted uh heavy weights you know heavy leg day four days four days a week for 30 years y your leg muscles would be fried right so so anyway so i wear this when i'm doing hard workouts i wear this monitor to keep me honest right and, and I, literally when i get home i download it into my computer i can see every 20 second interval of the entire workout the heart rate in beats per minute and i can see every ekg readout it's spectacular so i can sit, see where i have um you know av node disruption or any of this other stuff it's 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 pretty cool other than that um you know i can't use an hrv issue because because of these skip beats that i have as a result of the scarring tissue i hrv is not only meaningless to me it, it i've had hrv um apps where say yeah you're ready to go train hard today no it's like i got i'm skipping every third beat which looks good on an hrv but it's not really what's good 
Um, I've never, the sleep trackers, you know, I, I'm like, I wake up, oh, what a great night's sleep. I feel wonderful. And it says, no, you got zero deep sleep and, you know, you're going to die. So um, people wearing, you know, continuous glucose monitors, eh, you know, if you're really that into it, maybe two weeks uh, to find out what works or what doesn't work. But any anything beyond that, you know by now, right? You know what you should be doing. How are you going to alter your behavior? So, I, I you know, I the, the, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and 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 then many of the of the biohacking modalities of you know here you get the benefits of an hour and forty five minute bike ride in ten minutes because we compressed your, you know, your thighs with this and we and we shot, you know, water through them or. Some of these, like people, most of the biohacking community doesn't want to do the work. They're looking for a shortcut or a pill. And and that kind of like, that's not how nature works. That's not how the body works. Look, that's COVID, right? Everybody was looking for the vaccine to save us from COVID when, in fact, all you had to do was be exposed to COVID and deal with it. Have a strong immune system. Have a high vitamin D levels and whatever. Not to make little of the, you know. However, people, many people died. So you have to come back. We'll do a whole, sh whole show. Uh, you know, it could be a six-hour show on COVID. I think there's enough material these days. But I, I hear you on wearables. You know, for me, uh, on the on the CGM, I, I thought it was fascinating for ten days, and then I got it and was like, all right, I, I understand how my body responds. And then I, I do wear the the Aura and the and the Whoop, and what where I've had actionable insights. It's been around meal timing uh hydration alcohol which types of alcohol period day like stress and, and how i respond to it uh, it affects my hrv and i hear like the way i look at it directionally for me at least it seems to be somewhat reflective um uh, you know there there were certain there was a month that was so stressful like, a year ago uh for a variety of reasons and I, and I go back and look at it and i'm like oh man like hrv low totally makes sense and then i you know th there was a month we spent uh you know we're, we're, when we're on vacation when we're actually in florida when we're in miami hrv is over 100 resting heart rates at 40. i'm like this is amazing <laughs> uh but i agree it's they're not per and I think, but, but do you need do you need a device to tell you that i don't i don't sometimes i think it's helpful i think sometimes i like it help it helps me tweak things uh but to your point i remember last time you were on we were talking about like counting steps and it's like you gotta move you gotta walk but it's like don't take it too far well and the you know the whole fitbit thing with counting steps that's that's gotten that got way out of hand for a while you know with uh, with people um you know just um talking about orthorexia and food they were, you know, uh, just finish a beautiful meal in the south of France and it's 1030 p.m. And my friend goes, oh, shit, I got 5000 more steps I got to get today. I'll see you back at the house. I'm like, whoa, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> so in closing, I'm going to cl close with a question relevant to the book. So, so many great recipes in here. Do you have a favorite? What's your favorite recipe in the book? I don't like to, to play favorites because my my thing is no i mean anything that has to do with lamb or beef you know or even pork for that matter with some sort of a sauce that's got a healthy oil in it um i'm, I'm all in for any of that and i'm i'm more about uh the, the reason i have cookbooks isn't because i like to cook it's because i like to have people cook for me i like to tell them what what to make for me you just show up at someone's house with a book so here you go well that's a that's a great idea that's a I'll, I'll trade you. The, no, no, just I have a we have, you know, we have a chef or a ho and or a housekeeper at our houses that uh, generally would would fix a meal. And I'd say this is this is exactly what I want. We have a chef come in once a week in Miami. It's, it's really spectacular. And she'll make um, enough for three days for my wife and myself. Well, and then throw me in there. I'm coming over. You do the cold plunge, Mark. You do four and a half minutes. I'll do 30 seconds. I'm going straight up. To That's it. That's it. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Yeah, likewise, Chase. Thanks.